Hey guys, Graham and Chris back with you again. It has been uh, another pretty good length of time since our last show. Life has gotten in the way. Chris has uh, done some some relocating as far as uh, his living conditions. I was up in North Carolina, which we'll get to uh, hopefully in a little bit. But we are back, ready to roll. A lot of stuff happening with a trade deadline right around the corner. And of course, as we said a couple of weeks ago, we're going to be going live doing a show here in two weeks in Arizona over near Chase Field, hopefully. So we'll keep you guys apprised on that. Let's go ahead and put the ball in play. Chris, my man, I know you have uh, some pretty exciting news. Let's talk a little little personal here on the show starting out. Uh, you have gotten uh, picked up by a, a local high school in your area as a, uh, as a history and English teacher, I believe, and also you are uh, hopefully, uh, or you are in consideration, and hopefully we'll find out uh, if you get a chance to be uh, the head baseball coach of new said high school. So congratulations on the job, and tell us kind of what's going on with the uh, possibility of uh, coaching some young folks in our favorite pastime. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I did get a job here at, uh, at a local high school. Don't Union sound so surprised that I'm being nice. The heck, man. Well, like, you're like, well, it is wow. a little exciting. It's a little surprising. <laughs> Um, I did get a job uh, as, a, as an English and history teacher here at uh, Mingus Union High School in Cottonwood, and um, it's great. You know, I'm obviously two of my favorite subjects. I get to teach them both, uh, utilize both of my degrees, which is, you know, the dream. And uh, right after I got hired, I looked back on, on their website, and they had just posted that they were looking for a new baseball head coach, so I put in an application and I actually interviewed with the two athletic directors uh, and one of the other coaches in a formal interview today. And I should know something Monday or Tuesday as far as uh, what direction they're going to go in. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to coach baseball, be the head coach of their baseball program, which would be amazing. Um, you know, cause that means I'll be doing this show, which keeps me in touch with baseball on a, on a pretty constant basis plus playing baseball, plus coaching baseball. So I'll just have baseball in my life on an, on an almost daily basis. It'll be great. Awesome. Well, again, congratulations on that. And uh, I, I certainly hope that you'll be, uh, you know, forming and melding and corrupting, I mean, um, training young minds in how to uh, handle themselves <laughs> in baseball. And hopefully before too long, we'll hear about your first ejection. Moving on into the MLB standings. It has been a little bit of time, really, since the All-Star break that we've been had a chance to talk with you guys, and a, a lot has changed. At the same time, not a lot has changed. It's, it's ironic, man. I was listening to, uh, I think it was Joe Buck was on Mike and Mike on ESPN a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that he felt like really the, the drama of the MLB season, there, just, there wasn't really anything. It was kind of just a foregone conclusion this year, and I wanted to reach through the radio and – and physically strike him because yeah, well, you know, they're really that's really not the case. Buck. What's oh, that? God, well, you know how I feel about Joe Buck. I can't stand him. Well, and more often than not, I think that his opinions are either invalid or flat out wrong. Uh, and this is one of them. I mean, to, for him to say that it's a foregone conclusion, sure, it seems that way. But let's look at the National League West. Let's look at the American League East. Let's look at the, uh, Nash, do, at the American you, League Central. Of all people, do you really want to look at the National League West, of all people? Is that really where you want to go first? I'm just, I'm just looking out for your emotional well-being. I mean, it's been a while. I'm, I'm hey, strictly man. looking out for you right now. Hey, man, that's part of the drama of this <laughs> season. <laughs> yes, it is. But like you said, I, I mean – So let's look at yes, the American it, League East real quick. At the end of the day, there, there's, one, there's two divisions that are set, and that's going to be the NL East and the AL West. All right, a 17-game lead for the Astros um, in, in the, the AL West and a 13-game lead for the Nationals. The, the Braves are not going to end up uh, you know, finishing a, above 500. They're not going to be close. What we're going to end up having, maybe the Mariners, maybe the Rangers find it. At the end of the, at the, end of, the, uh, of the day, the NL East is going to be a, a, a division that ends with four teams below 500. The AL West is probably going to have at least three teams below Maybe you get the Rangers just breaking the 500 mark, um, but but all four teams below the Astros are probably going to flirt right around, uh, you, you know, an in, in even an even season. But when we look back in the American League East, I mean, right now you've got three teams with a two and a half games 
of the lead in that division. The, 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 the Red Sox were still going strong, although they're four and six in their last ten. We're seeing a, a ball club that's kind of finding itself. We talked about they need the third base, and we thought Todd Frazier might go there. Frazier kind of got scooped by the Yankees, but they pick up Eduardo Nunez from, uh, you know, from your, your favorite team in the Giants, which I know is painful for you to see, but it's a great pickup for Boston. I absolutely love the pickup as far as the, the pop and the speed. And, and the Yankees have made some really nice pieces uh, as well, pickups in, as far as uh, uh, you know, back ends of the bullpen and that kind of thing. But the odd, the odd part is, even with the Rays two and a half games out and sitting at 53 and 49, they actually are sitting outside of the wild card standings right now because of an 8-2 and two surge by the Kansas City Royals in the Central, who, albeit they sit two games back of the Tribe, but they've won eight straight, and they're actually sitting ahead of the, of the uh, Rays in that wild card, which you and I had written that team off a while back. We didn't think they were going to get it together. Things weren't making sense. All of a sudden, Hosmer's getting things together. He had his first career grand slam. Moustakas is swinging a great bat. You're starting to see things just falling into place for that team. They're a World Series team from a couple of years ago. Ned Yost has a great pedigree uh, and being a third base coach for years with the Braves under Bobby Cox. This is certainly intriguing as the Twins have fallen below 500, and, and I'm starting to get concerned they may begin to be some – may start looking at selling. They picked up Jaime Garcia from the Braves, but – I, I, I think the sell button might be getting ready to be pressed there. Uh, we know it has in, in Chicago with the White Sox, and I know you have seen some information that looks like the Tigers are probably going to be slamming on that red sell button quite hard uh, here in the next three or four days as we get near the end of the MLB trade deadline. Right, and most of that information comes from teams who are really hoping that they're going to be able to pick up Justin Verlander by the deadline. So we're about four days out from, from that moment. Um, and, you know, Monday night we'll know something. Um, but the Dodgers have said that they are quite confident that they're either going to pick up a Justin Verlander, a U Darvish, excuse me, or, um, or a Sonny Gray from Oakland by the trade deadline. They're going to fill a need and actually – the Dodgers right now seem like the unstoppable team. I mean, yeah. you could look at the NL West and you could say, well, that, that division's set too. And the division is. It's where the drama comes in and where Joe Buck's fallacy comes in is in the wild card in that division. Because if you go over here and you look at the wild card, well, right now the Diamondbacks and the Colorado Rockies seem, as they have all year, to be firmly entrenched in those wild card spots. You've got Milwaukee, four and a half. They're just trading trading blows back and forth. Right. And then the next team behind them is St. Louis, seven games out of the wild card. Um, And realistically, St. Louis is also four games back of the Cubbies for their division. So you've got to look at this as as a situation where Milwaukee, St. Louis, and Pittsburgh, who are the teams that are separated by the least number of games from the wild card, are in a position now where they have to make a push, right? They have to rush into a division lead or they're not going to the playoffs because the, the, the Rockies and the, and the Diamondbacks right now look like they're going to the playoffs. That's what it looks like. I mean, right. And, and unless and, something and, catastrophic and, and, happens with both of those teams, that's where we're headed. And so the Pittsburgh Pirates are another team who are going to be looking at, the, at, at teams like Detroit. Right? That, that, that to me right now is the up. biggest conundrum. The Pirates, to me, are, are, are probably one of the biggest teams to watch coming into the deadline. We, we know that the Cardinals are right. already have, have made moves to show that they want to be buyers, want to make a push. To me, the Pirates are the team that we need to see what they're going to do because right now one of the biggest dominoes we're waiting for is Garrett Cole. He's probably the biggest piece we want to know what's going to happen with. And right now they haven't made much talk, at least nothing, nothing really out there in the, in the media right now that we've heard that they're interested in moving pieces like Garrett Cole and that kind of thing. And coming up in a second, I want to tell you why I think Verlander goes to the Dodgers. I think, I think L.A. will get him to waive that no trade clause. I'll tell you coming up here in just a minute. But speaking of that team all the way over on the West Coast, they have a red flag up right now that has to have them worried that they need to deal with this before they even think about what's going to happen in October 
and that's it, that their ace pitcher, a guy who we both believe is going to vie for the, the National League Cy Young Award in 2017, is down with a back injury for the second Again. consecutive year. That's got to make you really worried. Now, you know, back tightness, I'm thinking, okay, get some Tiger Balm on your back. Don't get it anywhere else because it really hurts if you do that. Go into the sauna um, and, you know, loosen that back, those back muscles up and you're back to it. Then we find out it's a four- to six-week recovery time right now for him to get back on the hill. That's pushing us pretty deep well, into August, near the beginning of September, for him to come back. Right. And, and remember, and, in, and this is why, and, and this is something that, you're gonna, that you see, especially at a high, at a high professional level uh, in sports, where you see, okay, well, his back's tight. You, know, you see this in football, too. Oh, well, his, his hamstring's tight. Why is he out for two weeks? Oh, why is he out for four to six weeks with back tightness? Well, it's because um, the, exactly the same reason why, why Noah Syndergaard uh, uh, tore his lat muscle, right? Because he had tightness in, in the shoulder, and he had tightness on that side, and he ignored it. And he thought, hey, I could take a couple of days off, and I can come back, and I can throw. And, and then that muscle tears, and suddenly your season's over, or you're not coming back until September, and if that happens to Clayton Kershaw, that's, I mean, that's a huge blow to the Dodgers. It's not going to stop them from winning that division. At this point, <laughs> they're 12 and a half games up in that division. At this point, a Clayton Kershaw injury, even if he went down for the rest of the season, isn't going to stop them from winning that division. They have all the pieces in place to continue winning and to continue playing at a high level. However, going into the postseason, going into October baseball, it's going to be a huge deal not to have Clayton Kershaw opening up series. It's going to be a huge deal not to have him anchoring series. Because when you go into the postseason, now you're in a microcosm, like we've discussed before, you're in a microcosm of the season and anything can happen. And unless you have the absolute best guy on the mound that you could possibly have on the mound, who in this case is Clayton Kershaw, well, it's better to have him out four to six weeks now than it is to have him out for the rest of the season and not playing in the playoffs. It definitely. And the good thing is, is that Dave Roberts said it does not involve the herniated disc that he had last year that put him out for a couple of months. That's the one thing that you've got to be happy to see. I mean, that, that's obviously, uh, you know, a, 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 the biggest concern is, is he going to re-injure the same, the same issue or, you know, is the same issue going to reoccur? And then you start to worry about long-term effects, season after season, kind of like what we've seen with David Wright in New York. Now, I said a second ago, I'll I'll tell you why I think Verlander will go to L.A., and it's simple. He's getting married, and we know to whom he is uh, getting married to. That's Kate Upton. And as a model, as someone of her, uh, you know, of her stature, her prominence uh, in, in her profession, one of the sensible places for him to go to would be Los Angeles. So, you know, I highly doubt she's, you know, enthralled with the idea of making her home in Detroit. Uh, but to me, L.A. would make a, a really anybody? logical place for him to go, and it gives him that chance to once again make a deep postseason run when he really hasn't even sniffed the World Series since, what was it, 2012, I believe? And, and they got swept by San Francisco anyway. Right, and, and so Justin Verlander, is in a position right now where his legacy is set in stone, right? Anything that he does from here on out is just going to be adding to that legacy. There's really nothing he can do that he's a Hall of Fame guy. I mean, I, I fully, that, I fully that was expect my next to see him. Question is, that was my question. Would you put him in the Hall of Fame? So you answered that. But that's, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. I think he's a Hall of Fame player. Um, you know, I think he's a he's, he's, he's a first or second ballot guy um, still playing. And it does make sense for him to go to, San, uh, to Los Angeles because the one thing he, he can do to solidify, right, to, to, to cement that legacy or that, that slot in Cooperstown is, is, is rings. Rings are always going to be the one thing that people look at and go, well, you know, he did all this, he did this and that, but how many rings does he have? And let's face it, while they had a really great run, 2000, what, it was 2006 to 2012, 
Uh, they had a great run. And he, he, he played great baseball. He's a great pitcher. He's still a great pitcher. But their window is shut. And the Dodgers, the Dodgers are on an upswing. It looks like they're going to the World Series right now. It looks like they're the Cubs of last year. They're the, the team of destiny at this point. Uh, they're four games up on the entire – on all of Major League Baseball at this point. Um, and if he wants to win a championship, the Dodgers present the best opportunity for him. Going hand-in-hand hand with what you said uh, with him getting married to Kate Upton and her career, which is also realistically um, – I will say on, a, on its down slope – but she's definitely not as popular as she was four or five years ago. But if she does get into acting, as she's discussed um, getting into acting, then absolutely. And she's Los had Angeles a couple of yeah, she's played a couple of movies. Yeah, and she has. Uh, she's done uh, a couple of actually pretty good movies. Um, yeah. And so if that is, in fact, what she's going to do with her career, and that's what she wants to do, she's obviously she's going to continue modeling. I mean – there's no saying that Kate Upton is outside of her modeling years at this point. So for her to be in Los Angeles, him to be in Los Angeles makes perfect sense for that reason, like you said, but it also makes sense from the standpoint of this might be his last hurrah. This might be his last opportunity, last best chance to win a championship. Sure. Could he go to a Boston? Could he go to a Cleveland? Could he go to a Houston or a Washington or a Chicago? Yes. Uh, and, and, How and the Cubs clever. have been reported in being a, a very strongly interested team uh, in well, him. And, and the, and thing the is, good thing is – He if, could play in Chicago him, and not move. Yeah, and the good thing is That's you can bad. grab him because you know Arietta I, I, I would be absolutely flabbergasted if the Cubs re-sign Arietta at least to the asking price that he is going to want. With the production the way that it has been for the majority of the last couple of years, where we have seen a, a pretty good drop-off of that Cy Young level pitching that we saw from him a couple of years ago. But if you, if you go ahead and you allow Arietta to move on, you still have a power guy who has shown that he's kind of found that second resurgence. And as much as you say you, know, you can't rely on past performance to dictate you know, your future uh, choices, and you know, to, to kind of summarize it in, in a bit of a different way, Arietta's performance has not come back up to what you would expect. You have already seen the dip and the rise for Verlander, and he's been kind of riding that nice kind of level slope or, or, you know, you know, or, or level plane where he's pitching consistently well. And would be a good right. at this point a two or a three, you know, probably a two on a staff. You could put him Kershaw, Verlander, Lester, Verlander, and the nice thing is because you know if you get somewhere where you have righty lefty, you can go ahead and flip flop one and two to fit what you're going to be facing in the postseason and with teams that are important on your schedule. Right, and so let me let me throw my two cents in as to why I think Justin Verlander, if he leaves Detroit, is going to end up in Los Angeles, and. That is money. Um, there are very few teams out there who want to pay the $56 million that Justin Verlander is allocated through the rest of his contract. Uh, one team that I think would have zero issue paying that money is L.A. because L.A. has already maxed out the luxury tax at this point. They're already taxed in the highest luxury tax bracket. So who cares if you add another $56 million to the payroll? And Magic Johnson wants to win a World Series in L.A., period. He doesn't care what it's going to cost him. And because Clayton Kershaw is injured right now, they're in a position, the Dodgers are in a unique position, where if they want to maintain this comfortable lead that they have in the West, they need to find a guy like a Verlander or a Gray or a Darvish who can replace Clayton Kershaw in the number one slot for the next four to six weeks and not have an L every five days because Kershaw's on the DL or the possibility of an L every five days because Kershaw's on the DL. So I think that not only are they, do they not mind paying for him, I think they're going to go after a guy like Verlander because they want that strong veteran presence to replace Kershaw, who they can then knock one notch down in the, in the rotation when Kershaw comes back and have that, that really strong one-two punch. Right, and, and, and that's why I, I like the idea of them being able to go lefty-righty 
Um, I mean, right. it, it, it's a combination that, I mean, you can, especially going into the postseason, if you're, if they're this dominant, I mean, you, you can, you can flip one, two to, to fit whatever kind of lineup that your opponent's going to want to put in there. And I mean, it just, it really makes it a daunting task to get through, uh, especially when you're someone like the nationals who go through Zimmerman and then Murphy and Harper, who are again, both lefties, you can go ahead and pound those lefties coming in to try and get a one game, you know, lead up on that team. If those two end up meeting now, Moving on, and a team that we, we mentioned who, again, has absolutely took us by surprise has been the Royals, and they have uh, they are clearly making a, a push to, to try and have a successful uh, second half and going into October. Uh, they traded uh, starter Trevor Cahill, which I think is a great pickup. Uh, also, Brandon Marr and Ryan Buckter uh, from, uh, from the Padres – Cutters get Matt Strom, Travis Wood, and uh, Estuary Ruiz. Again, you know, we've talked about that. The big thing with the Orioles for a long time, or the, or the Royals, rather, for, for the last couple of years has been that at the end of the day, they could just get through, you know, maybe five innings. And then at that point, you just turn over to the bullpen and you go. They didn't have to invest as much in strong starters because as long as you could get those guys through five or six and they had an offense to do things with, with Kane, with Hosmer, Moustakis, it wasn't a big deal. I, I like the, the addition of Cahill. Um, you know, yeah, he's a sub-500 pitcher overall, but this year he's 4-3, and three, a 3.69 ERA, which uh, is, is decently below his career average. Uh, only allowed – Six long balls, and he's walked uh, 24. So, you know, he's not having uh, – not you know, it's a 1.3 whip, not great. But, again, I mean, this is a guy you're not looking to put in your number one spot. Uh, but they're making moves. They are uh, aggressively trying to fill the areas they need to, similar to what we've seen the Nationals do with the relievers that they picked up from Oakland and also with the trade uh, that, the, uh, um, that the Yankees have done – to get some extra pieces, including Todd Frazier. I, I like that. And, and obviously, I think the, the, the first piece that started all this, and I'll let you kind of – I know we're kind of jumping through a lot of the moves that have happened. But, but the one guy we talked about coming into this season, even starting in, in February, was Jose Quintana. And once the Cubbies finally grabbed him, which I would not have expected a cross-town trade like that, especially for what it means for the Cubs. Uh, obviously, the White Sox know they need to get pieces back and the Cubs were looking for something, uh, that, was, that was really the domino that started everything. And so far, you know, I mean, Quintana's numbers haven't been what they were last year, but I think he had over 10 strikeouts in his first uh, game in a Cubs uniform. You've got to make guys like Theo have seen happy. And, and I applaud Theo, like I said before, for not pulling the trigger on making a bunch of trades. At the end of the day, you have a young core group of players. You don't need to sell off assets to try and win now. You are built to win long term the next three four five years and in sports it's a long time i'd like that he's saying you guys play better i'll fill the holes but right now the holes are you guys i'm not going to get rid of you guys just to go ahead and try and get one thing now to have a glaring hole later on you know in the next couple of years i like what he's doing i think it's a great uh choice that he's making and he is he's putting the onus on the players which how often do we see executives really do that normally it falls on a manager or a, on a gm no, he's saying this is your guy's job to fix. We've put you in a position to be successful. Figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think after what, what Theo Epstein's done uh, in, in the past couple of years and bringing Chicago their first championship in 108 years, nobody can really question that he is a, not only a dedicated um, part of that team, but a very skillful trader and negotiator, and also really good at, at, at cultivating his, his own talent. I mean, when you have young, controllable guys on your team like uh, Rizzo and, and, um, and uh, Bryant Schwarber, well, Bryant, Schwarber's struggling, right, but you Bryant have guys Baez. who, by the way, got his first yeah. career ejection this year. Or, who, Baez or Bryant? Uh, no, Bryant got his first career ejection. The other day from Lance Barksdale for arguing a call third strike on the uh, – that, to be fair, it, it appeared to be inside. Uh, and, and surprisingly, he got the, uh, got the heave-ho from Barksdale. Wow. Um, but 
a lot of things have been going on around the league. Like you said, you were jumping around a little bit, and, and that's cool. I mean, there's a lot going on, and it's been a while since we've been on. We, we took sort of a break of our own during the All-Star break and after the All-Star break. So it's been a while since we've been around. A lot's actually happened in the last few days. But um, there are a couple of trades that happened that I really like that I think are really good for, for the teams who – acquired the stronger players and in my opinion uh two of the better trades that have gone on two of the stronger players that have been acquired um are with the colorado rockies and the boston red sox in the last couple of days let's talk about the colorado rockies first you and i have talked about pretty much all season we've discussed how one issue in the Rockies, in the Rockies organization, is that their pitching is young. Their pitching is young. They're not experienced. They don't have everything that it takes to know what's going to happen as they get deeper into a season. And I think by going out and getting Pat Neshek, who is an excellent reliever, great closer, who's having a fantastic year, He's uh, coming in 43 games. He's got 40 innings pitched. Uh, he's got a 1.12 ERA with 45 strikeouts. I mean, he's having a great year. His strikeout to walk ratio is at a solid nine. Um, but the most important thing to me is he's been in the league for 11 years, and he is the veteran type presence that the Colorado Rockies pitching staff needs to have around them. He's the veterans type presence that can get in there into the, into the bullpen and even into the, in with the starters and say, Hey, look, this is what you got to do. You got to buckle down and you got to act like you've been there. You got to buckle down and you got to, you know, play the game the way you played the game all year, because that's what's going to get you through. And, you know, as, as a young kid, you don't get that a lot. And, and I'll tell you, the Rockies had to just have, the biggest you-know-what eaten grin on their face about 10 days ago when the Nationals acquired Ryan Madsen and Sean Doolittle from the A's because you and I both thought, I mean, I think on air and off, that, that Nishak was going to be a guy the Nationals would, would, would covet because they needed those pieces in the back end of that bullpen. Then they go out and they grab these two guys for three prospects, and they're thinking, oh, dear God, now he's waiting you know the Phillies are going to move him because his trade stock is high. He was an all-star. I mean, he has been pitching just, like you said, fantastic this year. Someone was going to need it, and, and the Rockies had to just go, okay, we're not going to pull the trigger yet. Let's see what happens. But, but for those things to fall into place, I'm, I'm not saying the Nationals were wrong in not getting him because they picked up two pieces, but, God, that worked in the they, favor they of Colorado. Is so nice. They picked up three pieces, and they picked up three decent pieces. These are really good prospects. Pick, uh, Alejandro Rocanha, J.D. Hammer, and a shortstop in Jose Gomez, who are not top prospects in the Rockies organization, but they are. They add some depth to that to that minor league system it, for Philadelphia, and these are guys that are going to develop well. These are these are uh, probably. Uh, a minus B plus type prospects who are going to develop well. These are going to be big leaguers in the future. And it's going to add some depth to a team that in all honesty has in the past spent way too much money on big names and neglected their own development uh, because of it and are suffering from it right now. So I think it's a great pickup. I think it's a great pickup for the Rockies. It's going to help them really put a push the rest of the season. And it's pretty good for the Phillies too. It's not like they didn't get anything back for them. But the other one that uh, I thought was a really good pickup, and I discussed this the night it happened, I actually had the um, unique sort of experience to, to watch this go down on television. Uh, I, I was watching the Giants game, and uh, earlier in the game, Eduardo Nunez had been, hit, had been hit by a pitch in the elbow. Caught him in the guard, he went down, and late in the game, he, he came out. And I'm, he's standing in the on-deck circle, and Bochi calls him down off the on-deck circle. Connor Gillespie goes and, uh, excuse me, Kelby Tomlinson goes and puts on a helmet. And I think, okay, well, maybe he's got to ice the elbow. Maybe he, he's not feeling it, right? And Bochi walks over to him and, and hugs him. And I went, oh, crap. Uh-oh. Because <laughs> you don't get a hug from the skipper because your elbow hurts. I mean, this isn't Little League. 
you know. See, see, we need to get back to that kind of stuff, dang it. Like, you need to bring (laughs) the love back to baseball. You don't get a hug from the skip because because your elbow hurts, because you got dinged up. You don't get a hug for a whoopee? No, no, no. So he, he gives him he gives him a little hug and I went on oh, now, and then Brandon Crawford came over and was talking to him for a minute and then he hugged him, and then everybody started hugging him and I went oh, and it was it was a pretty interesting shot on television. They actually trained the camera down into the tunnel down into the back. There was ten or fifteen guys from the bullpen. Matt Cain's down there. A couple other pitchers. Hunter Pence is down there getting a drink, and uh, you know it was just. One after another, giving him pats on the back and hugs. It turns out Eduardo Nunez goes to the Boston Red Sox for Gregory Santos and Sean Anderson, two decent pitching prospects, which are ding, 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 exactly what the Giants need in their repertoire are guys who can go into their minor league system as pitchers and possibly be cultivated. But this is a huge pickup for a team who has had nothing at third base. Now, hold on. Before you move on to Boston, I, I, I don't want to sell you short, all right? And, and we have always agreed that, that we would give our audience full disclosure, right? Okay. I want everyone yes, to know. That is true. That Chris did have to actually get up and hug the television. He paused it. He wrapped his arms <laughs> around the screen. <laughs> felt like it was Eduardo Nunez. Gave him a hug. I think he even gave him a pat on the butt on the screen and then played it, and then it, it moved on. So this did hit home. It was tough for him. So understanding that you know, part of the reason we've had this break is to allow some emotional recovery. But I, you know, they say talking about it, I can see the acceptance. I'm really excited to see that you're moving on. You're the worst. And I love that you can't say the things that you want to say right now because we're because we're we're on. So that makes me even happier. But I, I'm really kind of excited to hear what is going to end up actually. Uh, what excellence are going to get hurled my way once we stop recording? Oh, there will be. Yeah. Oh, I know. I I have no doubt of that one. This is a great pickup for a Boston team who is have absolutely nobody. Here, Pandas Panda. You know.